So we've just seen that by use of measuring different isotopes in tiny grains of material, we can learn incredible things about the age of the solar system and all sorts of other astronomical features. So I thought we should do a, a, a video interview with Professor Trevor Ireland, who is the person who actually does these measurements, because we're talking about microscopic samples and rare isotopes of not very common elements. So it's always baffles me how you can actually even measure this. So thanks for doing the interview, Trevor. Thank you, Paul. So can you tell us what sort of samples you analyze in the lab here? The lab here is uh, really based on taking samples of in situ analyses of, of rocks and minerals. So we can take things and with a minimal amount of effort, just by polishing, we can get them into a mass spectrometer and uh, directly analyze the, the elements that we're, that we're after. So you do rocks from the Earth and from space? We do rocks from Earth and space, and one of the issues we have is how much we can actually stick inside a mass spectrometer, so we're sort of limited with what we can do, so we can't take a big rock, we're gonna take smaller amounts of rock, and of course, for some of the starter stuff that we analyze from uh, meteorites, they may be getting down to a few microns across, so very small sort of particles as well. So you analyze rocks from meteorites, and some of those meteorites are the chondrites we've already talked about, but some are also grains of stardust that are included in the protoplanetary nebula. But you've also done samples actually collected in situ from space probes here. That's right. So we're looking forward to getting some of the Hayabusa 2 uh, materials back. So currently, Hayabusa materials have been out. They came from a, an S-type asteroid, and that was uh, correlated to a, an ordinary chondrite. And currently, the Hayabusa 2 mission went to asteroid Ryugu, and that's brought us back a, a sample of a carbonaceous chondrite. So we're waiting to get that back into, our, into the lab as well. And in t times past, uh, this, this research school of Earth Sciences has done a lot of work on moon rock samples brought back from Apollo. And have you analyzed any of the Martian meteorites here? Or? Indeed, well, we'll start with the moon. That, that, the, the, the first analyses outside of uh, the US were actually carried out in Australia on uh, samples that Ross Taylor brought back. And there's some amazing old photographs of various people looking at the, the moon rocks because this was about a month after they actually, Neil Armstrong stood on the moon, carried them back in his pockets and um, handed them over to NASA and they came here within a month. So very quick turnaround. So Martian meteorites, we're also like, uh, working on those over. I've had a student working on uh, looking at water in the and uh, oxygen isotopes and, and various Martian meteorites from the surface of Mars. So we think we've already analyzed the surface of Mars, but we're quite happy if somebody wants to bring back a sample of Mars Spend as well. a few billion dollars and bring us back some better dollars. samples. Cost me 1,500 bucks for a, for a nice couple of grams of uh, Martian meteorite at the time. So that was a good deal. So you talked about you can't analyze samples too big, and most of the time you're analyzing samples that are really small, like tiny subgrains of a chondral that's no bigger than a marble. How do you possibly analyze something that small when you're looking for such rare elements? I mean, lead's not that common in most things, and isotopes are questionably rarer still. How can you analyze something that small? Can you show well, us? Let's go and have a look at some of the samples that we prepared earlier. So these samples are going to go into vacuum, so we have to wear nitrile gloves and protect our samples from greasy, horrible fingerprints and moistures and oil. You simply don't want all the ice tips in your hand contaminating it. Well, it's usually the air, the vacuum gets upset. A lot of the rare isotopes, you know, you don't, you don't have on your hands, but grease and things are bad. So we have a variety of samples under here. So maybe this one's a good one to start. So if you can get a close-up view of that. So you can see there's, there's actually, say, five millimeter grains across that surface, and they're stacked pretty close together. And so what we do is we put them down on a bit of sticky tape, these grains, and then we put a cast over the top and mold these into this epoxy. So this is a straight epoxy mound, and then we grind it away and polish it. And that is the surface that uh, we expose to, to, to our iron beams. So these are big particles, they're very straightforward to do. And then we can get down into um, smaller materials. Uh, so you can see here, this is something which is much harder to see. There's actually little dust grains down on that. And these are getting down to 100 microns, which is about the width of a hair, if you had hair on your head and things like that, we'll be able to see that. 
So they're much smaller, but still uh, quite tractable to polish down. And then finally, if we're looking at those tens of microns grains, this is a piece of gold foil, and what we do is lay the grains out on that gold foil and, and actually press them in. So a lot of the, the things we're looking at for pre-solar grains are carbides, which are very quite really quite hard. So silicon carbide, diamond, you can press them in. If it's graphite, we just let them sit there on the surface. So those are the, the three main mounting techniques that we actually have. So you have a carbonaceous chondrite, presumably you'd uh, just polish the surface and then you can look at different grains within it. Exactly. So I have a student at the moment who's looking for uh, oxygen isotopes and water concentrations in carbonaceous chondrites. He's doing, making metal mounts. I can't see one here at the moment, but they, they're just basically embedded in metal because we don't want the epoxy is actually full of water. We don't want that. And so we're actually after something which is very clean, but uh, very met metallic to, to, to grab onto the very, samples. Very hydrogen free. Very hydrogen free. But if we were looking for some of these other rare isotopes, you know, the, the, the chances are those metals wouldn't be appropriate as well. So it's very much a matter of, uh, of uh, uh, deciding on what you're going to mount these samples in at the time of actually figuring out what analyses you're going to make. Okay, so once you have it in a, a sample, what next? So then we put them inside one of these mounting rings, and that's a uniform mounting ring. It's screwed in at the back, so we put it face down, and then it comes up against that um, the inside of that ring on the surface, and that holds it in a very specific orientation and uh, so that we can then load it into the mass spectrometer. Okay. And then step over this one, then this goes up in here, this is at vacuum now, so this is our introductory port. This would swing open and um, we'd vent this, swing it open, load it up in this position here, uh, and before it goes down into the ultra-high vacuum uh, part of the instrument. Did you have an airlock bottom. type arrangement so you don't have to pump everything down every time you put a new sample in? Exactly. So this is the airlock, so it saves us not having to vent the whole mass spectrometer. So we only vent a little bit of it and then uh, pump that away, and there's a, there's a backing pump on the floor here. You may have heard the uh, story that nature abhors a vacuum, and you as an astronomer know very well that's not true. Yes, nature, most of the universe is a vacuum. Most of the universe is a vacuum. Nature I'm sure is, your vacuum here is nothing like a vacuum in space. No, we, we'd love to have that. In fact, you know, flying in orbit would be a great thing. But nature does abhor a vacuum pump. And so and this is a noise you can hear in the background. It's uh, lots of pumps trying to keep the vacuum as... There's pumps and there's air conditioning. It's a very noisy lab, so exactly. So this goes in here, pumps away, and then we stick it down the bottom here. So this is facing... The sample is facing this way in this machine that way. And then we can... Uh, around the back here, we have... We actually generate a, an iron beam at the back here. That's an oxygen dual plasmatron. Okay. So we create an oxygen plasma. Because it becomes plasma, we can accelerate it. Focus yeah, the sort of it. plasmas we were talking about in our interview with Cormac. Exactly. It's exactly the same thing, except we like ours more constrained and, and uh, we're not after the volume aspect, we just want it moving in the right way to. It's a means to an end, not an end in itself. That's right. So yeah, we're all using the same basic physics, but how we actually manipulate it uh, takes a little bit more. Okay. So there's all sorts of gauges here and uh, there's uh, various accelerating brakes and so forth. But the idea is you get a focus on iron beam down so we can ablate a particle uh, that's 10 microns across. So it's a 10 micron wide beam. By the time it's a 10 hits micron there. beam, we can get down that much. Um, so yeah, so we, we obviously we change that a little bit because if the, the particle's bigger, we can use a slightly wider beam and get more signal out of it. So it comes down to signal to noise as well. And because this is a rock, we have not necessarily pre-concentrated the elements that we're after. We, we can use nature as a, a refining tool to uh, separate all the elements out and concentrate them. And so we pick on specific minerals to get specific high concentrations of elements that we're after. But if you've only got a few grains of stardust, you don't have that choice, presumably. And there's exactly. some natural concentration, fractionation in the rocks. No, for silicon carbide, we'd be analyzing silicon isotopes, carbon isotopes. We also do nitrogen, and then there's a, a, some isotope elements that we, we know we have high concentrations of, refractory elements such as titanium. We can measure the, the titanium isotopes in those as well. 
Okay, so the beam comes in, it hits the sample here, and then it's ablating off some of the atoms. What happens to the atoms once they've been knocked off? So when, when you, once you have this energetic primary beam coming down, hitting the sample, it ablates, but it also imparts so much energy onto the target atoms that they're vibrating, you lose electrons. And if you lose an electron, you become ionized. So this is known as a secondary ion mass spectrometer. Okay. We have the primary beam to ablate the sample, but also to cause ionization of the secondary material that's coming off. And so the, the secondary ions are primarily from the, the target atoms in the target you're looking at. So once that's ionized, we go through a series of lenses and that accelerates it. Yep. So and presumably then, once it's ionized, it's got electric charge, so you can apply an electric field and like in the back of an old old TV, and it's exactly accelerates what it, is. it forwards. And so it accelerates forwards. So the way we have this configured, we have a 10 kilovolt drop between the primary duoplasmatron and the sample, and then we go back up to real ground. So we flip polarities, so we bombard with a negative oxygen species, we flip polarities, and then we extract the secondary positive ions with the same electrical setup. Okay, so you can then accelerate them, and they're accelerating down here, is that right? It's accelerating down through here. This is a beam shaping device. I'm sure you've seen the accelerator. It's all sorts of beam shaping things there. Really, so this that's is making sure it's a nice tight beam rather than <laughs> particles going all over the place. Exactly, so it's focusing so... With magnetic get, fields, is it, or electric fields? So, so our, here we have our strong magnetic field, which every good mass spectrometer has a magnetic field. So most of these are magnetic separation. Can do it otherwise. This is a sector magnet, and so sort of uh, one ton of steel, sort of uh, separating out the, the the particles. So the ions come in, and from Lorentz law. Yeah. So you've got a nice tight, narrow beam coming out of here. This is formed it up to make it nice and tight. That's right. And then it goes in through here, and the and magnetic field is trying to bend it. It's the magnetic field is pulling on those ions as they go through. So it's, uh, it's a homogeneous magnetic field. So they're tracing an arc, and the, the radius of that arc is dependent on their mass. Because, of course, the whole trouble with separating isotopes is they're chemically identical. No chemical experiment can tell the Correct. difference. So what you're doing here is they've got the same charge because they've lost one electron each. One electron. One we, electron we, we, we just do one, yes. Okay, so everything's lost one electron, so they've got the same electric charge. They're going to get the same speed, presumably. But then the magnetic field, the heavy ones, won't get pushed around as much. Exactly. So the... The, the, the light ions will deflect more, heavy ions will stay out to the outside. So it's kind of like some sort of race track where you've got the heavy cars on the yeah, outside of the bend. they can't quite make the corner, that's right. Whereas yeah, the, the to light do a ones are... Yeah, trying the truck, it's not going to corner quite as well. That's exactly what's going on. Even if it's got the same tyres and the same engine, it's just not going to go around the same. That's right. Okay, so by the time they're coming out here, hopefully you've got the different isotopes separated. That's right. So we actually, this is a, a single, because this is, this is known as reverse geometry because the magnet occurs before this electrostatic sector, but the electros because what we're doing is separating according to mass, but from the Lorentz law, we also know we're separating according to velocity and right. size, because we're smashing these things with ions, some, yeah. some particles may Being come up with a lot others. of velocity, others may just ionize at the surface. So. So that's tricky because you don't know whether it's been separated because it's heavier or because it just was knocked off faster from back over that's there. That's exactly what what's it's all about, and so they have these these uh, electrostatic analyzers and we, uh, where we have two plates at a set potential and so the ions of the potential we want are going through the middle of that and so then we cause this uh, velocity dispersion. So if you've got excess velocity, you go to the outside of the racetrack again. Okay. And so, so then you're spitting it, it out by velocity and by mass. Hopefully. And so we're, we're correcting for both the velocity of the target and the mass and we need that because we want really high mass resolution. Okay, so, yeah. uh, you're trying to find two different lead isotopes that's only like a 1% difference in mass or something. So the, 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 the case in point is doing those lead isotope measurements because they're usually done by chemical separation because the concentrations of uranium and lead are so small that they separate out the uranium and the lead and the more lead you've got, the better the precision. So that's how they get down to that one million year or sub million year yeah. precision for the age of the solar Something like that, they chemically analyze it first probably in a different lab somewhere around to concentrate it, That's right. and then they might feed that through a device like this. It's a similar device, but it doesn't have that primary ion beam. You might be using a, a plasma source or a, a thermal filament to evaporate the, the target element, the lead away, and do that measurement. So slightly different, but 
same basic physics and same uh, processes going on. Okay. So by the time you've got it out here, you've presumably sorted everything out. Now we're going for high mass masses. resolution. So we have a, a slit here, and we're just trying to go through that very narrow slit. So it's maybe 100 microns wide, and for, for that we can get up to about 20,000 resolution. So we can separate mass 20,001 from mass 20,000, if we could go that high in mass. And so... Um, so what fraction of what goes off there actually makes it through the slit by the time it's it gets reasonably here? reasonably high. It's of the order of, uh, depending on what resolution, what slits you're using, it's of the order of 10%. So okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a fair bit of uh, material that gets down there. And then finally, presumably, you've got some sort of detector here to measure what's coming through. So there are electron multipliers and there's a, 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 a cup. So the cup just basically accumulates charge and we measure the charge. The electron multiplier causes a slight discharge at the surface, bounces off and creates an electron, and then electrons cascade down and multiply, and you get um, about a 10 to the 7 fold increase in charge. From one ion, you get 10 to the 7 electrons. So you're basically counting every ion here. We count so, so every ion. A, every ion single, is special. Yes, uh, you, you get a about 10 million time amplification for every ion will get you a, and that a surge of voltage. Measure. And that gives us a pulse, and we can measure that pulse. And then presumably there's electronics on here that's uh, very rapidly counting the pulses. Yeah, so there's a high voltage input here, so that's creating the high voltage for the acceleration of your multiplier. And then the signal comes out through this, this one here. And, and then presumably goes through processing. Into a black box. Yes, and eventually ends up on a computer and some exactly, sort of software so, to analyze it. Exactly.